stand and worship this morning. Are you ready to give him praise? Are you giving, ready to give him honor? Come on, he's worthy of our praise. Oh, we worship, we worship, we welcome you, Lord. Be welcome in this house. Oh. Come on, if you're watching from home, welcome him. Come on, sing this out. Of creation, all of the earth, make straight a highway, a path for the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. Call back the sinner, wake up the saint, let every nation shout of your name. Jesus is coming. Like a bride waiting for her group We'll be at church ready for you Every heart longing for our King We sing even so
has come But we invite your presence Even so come Lord Jesus come But we want more of you Holy Spirit Lord Jesus come Come on just welcome him Even so come Lord Jesus come But we welcome you Even so come Lord Jesus come One more time Every voice Even so come Lord Jesus come Come and have your way
much we need him, how much this church needs him, how much your family needs him, how much this city needs him, how much this country, the state needs him.
maybe not necessarily in the corporate place, but especially in our personal relationship with you, that we will be set on fire in our prayer rooms as we go after you in the name of Jesus, that there will be tongues of fire coming out of our mouths in the name of Jesus, that we would prophesy, that we would have dreams, that we would have visions. As we're in the last days, Lord, I pray as we submit to you that your glory would fall in Jesus' name. Let your glory fall in this room. Let your glory fall in our families, in our, in our homes, in our schools. We need you. We need you, God. Come in power. Come in power. We're done living any passive Christian lives. We're ready to be set on fire. That as people see us, that they will know without a shadow of a doubt that we belong to you that we operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come on, church. Are you a church on fire? Are you a church after his presence? Amen. Amen. Lord, we thank you right now. We just thank you for this beautiful moment after your presence, beautiful moment in your course. Thank you, God, the people that we can all gather together and worship you and with one voice declaring who you are, our God, our Lord, our Savior. So Lord, receive all the glory, receive all the honor. In Jesus' name we pray and the church says, amen. Come on, one more time, let's give it up for our Lord. Amen, amen. Church, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Andres, I'm the Central Campus Worship Pastor. If you are new to this church, we wanna welcome you, but we also want you to know that you, I mean, this is how we are. We love going passionately after Jesus, amen? Amen. So thank you for joining us again, and it's such a joy to be here with you. If you could do me a favor, just turn around for a moment. You can wave at the person behind you, beside you, and then you may be seated. Thank you. One of the defining values of Radiant Church is that we're to be a house of prayer. We exalt the Lord, seek God's direction, minister to human need, and advance the kingdom of God all through prayer and prayer warfare. And the driving force behind this is Exodus 17, our Radiant Prayer Ministry. The mission of Radiant's prayer ministry is derived from the account in Exodus 17, where Moses was leading the people of Israel in battle but he needed Aaron and her to hold up his arms as the battle continued. And like Moses, Pastor Todd and I know we need people to uphold us in prayer as we lead the church and do battle against the forces of darkness. Exodus 17 is structured and deployed as an army of prayer warriors who are trained, empowered, and strategically commissioned to provide a protective prayer covering for the leaders and the people of Radiant Church to intercede for our community, our nation, and our world, and to confront the powers of darkness through focused spiritual warfare, and because spiritual warfare is a constant reality until Jesus returns, we're looking for new people to join our prayer warfare team. So if you have a heart for prayer, intercession, and spiritual warfare, we have a place for you in the Radiant Prayer Ministry. And to become a part of this core ministry, there are two requirements. The first is to go through the Ascent classes and complete the church membership process. The second is to go through an Exodus 17 orientation, where you learn about the structure and strategy of the prayer ministry and are then personally commissioned and inducted into our army of prayer warriors. We've scheduled an Exodus 17 orientation session on Monday evening, September 28th at 6.30 p.m. at the North Campus. We'll be socially distanced for your safety, but we'll prepare you and empower you to enter the battlefield as a Radiant Church prayer warrior. So if this is something you feel called to do, mark your calendar for Monday evening, September 28th, and be sure to register in advance so that we can prepare enough training materials. If you want to attend this session, contact Pastor Todd at radiantchurch.org. This is a critical time in the life of our church and in our nation. 
And there's never been a time where we need people more sold out for God, who have faith, and who have a passion to pray, intercede, and do battle in the Spirit. Good morning, Radio Church. How's everyone doing today? Now, I just want to say, can we give a round of applause? I know I'm a bit biased, but our worship team, they crushed it today. Let's give a round of applause for them, please. Well, I just want to take a moment to welcome everyone who's watching online. Thanks for joining us. And thank you to every single one of you that was able to be here live in person. It means so much to us to be able to look off the stage and see smiling faces. And if you're not smiling, why can't you smile? Jesus is here today. Let's smile about that, right? Come on. Now, if this is your first, second, or third time joining us, I'd like to invite you to fill out a connection card. There are two ways you can do that. You can fill it out online on my personal favorite, the Radiant Church app, because there's so much cool things in there. Or if you are uh, here in person, in the seat back in front of you is a connection card that you can fill out. Put as much information as you're comfortable giving us. All we wanna use that for is just to connect with you, to introduce ourselves, to pray for you, or more importantly, just to answer any questions you may have for the church. Now, as Pastor Todd and Pastor Kelly just talked about, Exodus 17 is looking for warriors. They're looking for an army. And I know there are a few soldiers in here ready to join the prayer ministry of Exodus 17. If you have not taken the Ascent classes yet, this is a fantastic time for you to do so. All you have to do is email connect at radiantchurch.org. And what we'll do is we'll send all four courses to you so you can watch online. All four courses you could do in one evening and then you could reach out uh, to Jenny Dunn, our connections director, and she'll set up a face-to-face -face or a Zoom meeting, whichever you're comfortable with, to do your membership meeting. So you can become part of Radiant Church and join that amazing prayer ministry. Now, the Ascent classes, they're not just so you can go into Exodus 17, they're so you can hear from our senior pastors, Todd and Kelly Huddle, as they share the heart and the mission statement of Radiant Church to help us grow and become passionate followers of Jesus Christ who impact our world. And that's exactly what we were just singing tonight, right? We were just singing that we need the God of revival to come. We need passionate followers of Jesus Christ. And so as we get ready to have Pastor Todd come up here, I wanna make sure we pray for all of you guys, for our nation, for our leaders. But as you know, November 3rd is a pretty big day. It is election time. And this is where we as the body of Christ need to come together. And we're encouraging you guys to vote based on biblical principles. One of the ways you can do that is you can go to myfaithvotes.org and you can figure out exactly where each party and each candidate stands on a position. That way, when you go to vote, you can make that vote count towards biblical principles. And if you're not registered to vote, it's okay. If you go to myfaithvotes.com, or yeah, .com, you can actually register to vote right on there and then we can get you set up from there. So we wanna pray for that as well. So if you don't mind, if you would just with me as a, as a body of Christ, would you bow your heads with me as we pray for these things in Pastor Todd's message. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you, God. Thank you for the blessing that you give us each and every day, but especially today, Lord, a building to come into so that we as your church can be together, to connect together, to praise you, to worship you, and to give you the honor and glory that you deserve. And Father, we just pray right now for our nation. God, we are a nation that is lost. And we are a nation that needs you to be at the forefront of every decision. So right now, God, we pray for our leaders, our congressmen, our senators, your, your mayors, your governors, the Supreme Court, your justices, all of them, God, that each of them will do as we did this past weekend in the return, that we repent that we turn away from our ways, from our choices, and we look back to you, God, that we look to you and we honor you in the biblical choices that we make, the biblical decisions that we make. So Father, we pray, just as it says in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, we pray that you will hear our cries because your people, your people are humbly coming before you today, crying out to you, seeking your face, confessing our sins, repenting of our choices. And we know, God, that you will heal your land. God, we, we, we spoke earlier and we sang together, awaken this city, but God, not only awaken Colorado Springs, awaken every city, in every state, in every nation, because this is not our city, it's your city. And we declare these cities in the name of Jesus Christ today, 
And Father, we just, we pray your Holy Spirit will come and fall upon each and every one of us. Convict us, Lord. Stir inside of us. Light that fire again that we need to run out of this building today to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we know that you are working in Pastor Todd's message. Earlier today, everyone was singing the shout of praise of Jesus Christ. Holy, holy, holy. So God, we just lift you up right now. Holy Spirit, we welcome you into this place and we pray a fresh anointing over Pastor Todd as he delivers his message. In the mighty and powerful name of Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. Good morning, Radiant Church. So good to see all of you today. It's also great to have all of you with us that are at our North Campus, at our Woodland Park Campus, and all of you watching online. Thank you so much for being with us today, and let's give them a big hand. We are in a study of the book of Revelation, so you can turn there today. It's the last book of the Bible. It's the wrapping up of all things. And we have covered the first three chapters of the book of Revelation. It's taken us nine weeks, but now we should be speeding up, just not today. Today we're going to look at one verse. So we can go to Revelation chapter 4, but actually before we get there, we're going to take a look at the outline that Jesus gives us of the book of Revelation. You can find it in Revelation chapter 1, verse 19. We read, and this is is what Jesus is dictating to John the Apostle. Write the things which you have seen. Now, what are the things that he has seen? Well, we saw that in John's revelation of Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 1, where he saw the resurrected, glorified, exalted Lord Jesus, and he fell at his feet. Then he says, the things which are. What are the things that are? It is the account he gives and the letter he sends to the seven churches of Asia Minor. And we covered them one week at a time, all seven churches. And then he says, the things which will take place. What are the things that will take place? Well, they are the things yet to come. And that begins in chapter 4, and it goes all the way through chapter 22, the things that will take place. So you could say that this is a three-act drama, the things he's seen, the things that are, and the things that will take place. And in verse 19, the things that will take place is the Greek words meta tauta. That becomes important as we get into chapter 4. So let's look at chapter 4. He says, after these things. These things are what occurred in Revelation 1, 2, and 3. Then he says, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. So he is going to be given access to the immediate presence of God. And the first voice which I heard, once he enters essentially the portal to heaven, The first voice he hears is like a trumpet speaking with me saying, come up here. 
Now, when you see a trumpet, understand that so often a trumpet or a shofar is associated with the return of Jesus Christ and specifically the rapture of the church. And he hears a voice that says, come up here. Now, what's really interesting is in those first three chapters of the book of Revelation, the word church or churches is used 19 times. That's a lot of times in just three chapters. But after chapter 3, the word church or churches is not used again until you get to the very end of the book and Revelation chapter 22, the wrapping up of all things, a new heaven and a new earth. It's almost like the in-between time the church isn't even there. Because again and again he says, and you, we read it, if anyone has ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. But when you get to Revelation 13, verse 19, he says, if anyone has an ear to hear, let him hear. Doesn't say anything about the church. As I said, it's like the church isn't there. It's like it's disappeared because I believe it has been caught up to be with Jesus. Remember, he heard, come up here. And in the same way, the church of Jesus Christ is going to be caught up to be with the Lord. Look at verse 1, the very end, and he says, and I will show you things which must take place after this. The words after this in the Greek language are, you guessed it, meta tauta, which he's saying, this is act 3. You've seen act 1, you've seen act 2, and now we come to act Three. But before Act 3 begins, you have the rapture of the church. The church of Jesus Christ is taken up to meet him in the air. Now, there are various views of the rapture of the church. One, of course, is a pre-tribulation rapture, which you can already tell, I believe. There is also what is called a mid-tribulation rapture or something that happens during the tribulation where the church is caught up. And finally, there is the post-tribulation rapture. And that is at the very end of a seven-year tribulation that comes upon the earth, the church of Jesus Christ will be caught up. Now today, I'm going to explain to you why I believe in a pre-tribulation, pre-millennial, before the millennium, rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. But here is something you need to understand. You do not have to believe it the way I believe it to be part of Radiant Church. Now, I believe there are some things, as a follower of Jesus Christ, if we say we're biblical Christians, we must believe. I think we even must believe that Jesus Christ is coming back again. But what that's going to look like, at what point the rapture occurs, that is something that is open for debate open for discussion, but I want to explain to you why I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Now, in saying that, let me also say that if you don't believe it the way I believe it, you still want to stick around for the book of Revelation. Because regardless, this book is a book filled with victory, and we see the ultimate victory of Jesus Christ, and so you're going to want to continue with the book. But today, I want to focus on this event that occurs before we enter into the rest of the book. And so we're going to look at reasons we can believe in a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. And one reason I absolutely love this subject is that there is absolutely nothing in my life, not one problem that can't be solved by a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. I mean, it's all solved then. All my problems are gone. And so I love this topic. And so did the Apostle Paul. He's going to talk about it here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18. He's writing this church in Thessalonica that he had visited just two weeks, but it started. The church was launched. The church began and the church started. And he had talked to them about the second coming of the Lord. And in doing so, they did have some confusion because some of their members began to die and they were concerned that those members were going to miss the rapture of the church. So Paul writes them to comfort them. And we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 16, for the Lord himself. I absolutely love that. It's not going to be an angel. It's not going to be some prophetic representative, he says. But the Lord himself will descend from heaven. He's going to come down from heaven. The Lord Jesus has been in heaven. Now he's going to descend from heaven. 
with a shout. Oh, I can't wait to hear that shout. With the voice of an archangel. And with, there it is. With the trumpet of God. There you hear the trumpet. Remember, he heard a voice like a trumpet. And the dead in Christ will rise first. The dead in Christ are those who have believed in Jesus but have physically died. However, we know they're not in soul sleep because Paul also said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So those, these people are in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ because they have passed from this life. And if you have loved ones in the Lord, they are in the presence of the Lord. But at this time, they're going to come back and they're going to come into their bodies. And so it says the dead in Christ will rise first. So they come up first. They're the first ones to be involved in this. And I think it's because they're six foot under the ground and they need a head start. So they're coming up. Then we who are alive and remain. Paul is saying there are people who are going to be followers of Jesus who are going to be alive on the earth when Jesus Christ returns for his church. And they shall be caught up. I want you to underline that word or those words caught up because we're going to come back. Those are very important words. They are going to be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So this happens in the atmosphere. This doesn't happen on the ground. This happens in the atmosphere. And then we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, what I truly believe is that the return of the Lord, the second coming of the Lord, comes in two parts. And we're going to call the first part the rapture of the church. The second part we're going to call the second advent. At Christmas time, we talk about the first advent. The first advent is the first coming of Christ. The second advent is the second coming of Christ. On both accounts, God himself in the person of Jesus comes and sets his feet on the earth. First as a baby, but then as a most severe judge. The first event, the rapture of the church, is a private event. The world doesn't see it. The world isn't a part of it. That we are caught up to be with the Lord. The second event is not a private event. Every eye will see. Everyone will know what happens. Because according to the book of Zechariah, which I just read this morning, Jesus is going to come down. He's going to set his feet on the Mount of Olives. And the Mount of Olives are going to split in two. It's going to be an extraordinary time that everyone on earth is going to witness. Now, the word caught up in the Greek language is the Greek word harpazo. And harpazo is a word that means to be caught up, to take something by force, to snatch away. Now, in 383 AD, a man named Jerome was commissioned to write a translation from the Greek language into the Latin. We call it the Latin Vulgate. And when Jerome wrote the Latin Vulgate, he had to translate this word, harpazo. And he translated it into the Latin word, raptus, raptus, which means rapture. So I've heard people say, well, the word rapture isn't even in my Bible. Well, that's because you don't have a Latin Vulgate. If you have a Latin Vulgate, you'll read raptus. You'll read about the raptures, where we get the word rapture. Some of you laughed about that, but there's a member of our church that came to me after I talked about this and said, I have a Latin Vulgate and I have read that. So we do have a few refined members in our congregation. <laughs> Kenneth Wiest, who's one of my favorite scholars of the Greek language, has written a beautiful a beautiful translation of the New Testament. It's called the Wiest Version. And here's how he translates 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. He says, we shall be snatched away forcibly in masses of saints, having the appearance of clouds for a welcome meeting with the Lord in the lower atmosphere. And then always shall we be with the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? And Paul says, knowing that should give us comfort. It should give us comfort comfort. Now, to me, that tells me there's a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Because if there wasn't a pre-tribulation rapture of the church, that wouldn't give me a lot of comfort. Because what we're going to find in the book of Revelation is that the time of tribulation is going to be the worst time for human beings on the whole history of this planet. And what is going to happen is going to be quite extraordinary. So Paul could have put it this way. 
When Jesus Christ comes back, you're going to go through cataclysmic events. A meteor is going to hit the earth. The earth is going to suffer all kinds of horrible plagues and pestilence. And in the middle of that, an antichrist is going to arise. And you may be beheaded. Certainly, most of your friends and family are going to be dead. And at the end of it, if you can survive, then you can be encouraged, I'll be back. But that's not what he says. He says, Jesus is coming back and you can be encouraged. And the idea that before all that happens, Jesus is going to come and catch me away, that gets me excited. That encourages me. That encourages me. How about you? I can tell it's encouraging some people right over in this part of the auditorium. That's good. So there's going to be the shout. There's going to be the voice of an archangel. And John says, he hears, come up here. I think that is speaking. John's experience is speaking of the rapture of the church where we come up here to meet Jesus in the air. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Beginning in verse 51, he writes, Behold, I tell you a mystery. The Greek word is mysterion. Mysterion means something that was a mystery in times past but now has been revealed. Or there is a group who is privy to this mystery. And those privy to the mystery is the church of Jesus Christ. You see, in the Old Testament, it doesn't at all talk about a rapture. It talks about the second advent, the second coming of Jesus Christ. But there is absolutely no mention of a rapture because it is a mystery to people of the Old Testament. However, there are types of it. There are shadows of it. We're going to see that. But when Jesus came, he began to reveal it. Just like he began to reveal there was coming a church. It was part of the mystery. Verse 51 goes on, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. One time I was traveling and speaking at a church, and I happened to go into their nursery. And up on the wall, they had that very scripture. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. (laughs) Good nursery scripture. But this is not talking about babies. What this is talking about is that when Jesus Christ returns, we're going to be changed. We're going to be like him. This corruptible body is going to put on incorruption. This mortal body is going to put on immortality. There's going to be no more sickness, no more pain, no more death in these physical bodies. If you have acne now, you're not going to have acne then. If you're missing an arm, it's going to come back. If you're missing a kidney, you get it back. But a glorified, resurrected kidney, whatever that looks like. Ah, somebody really like that. In the name of Jesus, we speak healing to that kidney. All right. Let's look at uh, verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. What's the twinkling of an eye? It is the time it takes for light to hit the organ of the eyeball and then to go to the brain. The time it takes to go from the eye to the brain is the twinkling of an eye. It's going to happen like that. And nobody's even going to know it. They're just going to see the results of it. That's how quickly it's going to occur. And then he goes on to say, For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. In Revelation chapter 4 and 5, John has an experience similar to that. He hears, come up here, and when he comes up, he's in the presence of Jesus. He's in heaven. And every tribe and kindred and tongue and people and nation are there worshiping the Lamb of God. It's a beautiful sight, and we're going to read about it when we move into our message next weekend. But in looking at that, I want to refer to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13, because this is a very important understanding about the difference between the second advent and the rapture of the church. In 1 Thessalonians 3, 13, the apostle Paul says, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, speaking of the second advent, look at this next word, with all his saints. At the rapture of the church, he comes back For his saints, at the second advent, he comes back with his saints. And we are going to be those saints. Jesus alluded to this event in John chapter 14. This is a very familiar and comforting verse of scripture. John 14, beginning in verse 1. Jesus said this, let not your heart be troubled. We live in a troubling time. We live in a time where your heart can be troubled. But Jesus says, 
let not your heart be troubled. Don't let it be overwhelmed with anxiety or fear or dread. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I love this line. I go to prepare a place for you. Here's something that encourages me so much. God, the Lord Jesus himself, created the heavens and the earth. And it took him six days. And isn't this an extraordinary planet? Every time I take a look at the front range and Pikes Peak, I'm in awe of God's creation. It only took him six days. However, he said, I go to prepare a place for you, speaking of heaven. And he has been gone 2,000 years. What a place that's going to be. It's going to be extraordinary. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I love this, I will come again. Jesus is coming back and receive you to myself. Where is that? Up in the atmosphere. He's going to catch us away and he's going to receive us to himself that where I am, which is heaven, you may be also. He's going to catch us up to be with him in glory. You say, that sounds incredible. So does creation. So does the parting of the Red Sea. So does Jesus Christ rising from the dead. The Bible is a book of miracles and a miracle is coming. A miracle is coming. Now, all of this is an allusion to the Jewish wedding. If you were a man in that day and you wanted to get married and you found a woman you wanted to marry, you had to pay a price for her. You had to pay a dowry. And after you paid that dowry and it was agreed upon, then she became your betrothed. And because of that, she was set apart and you were set apart. She was set apart not to be with any other man and to only think of you. And then after that period was done, he would go back to his father's house and he would begin to prepare a room on his father's house where he and his bride would then live. And then there was a time period. It was usually about a year. It was a, quite a long time period. But eventually he came back with an entourage of his friends and family and they would come back oftentimes at night with torches lit and they would come and he would receive his bride to himself and then he would take her back and she would enjoy the marriage supper of the lamb with her husband it was a great party and in the middle of it they would get away to a private place where they would consummate their marriage at the very end of it which was seven days long Seven, you, you think our weddings are long now, seven days long. At the end of this, he would come out and he would announce, this is my bride and she would be unveiled. Jesus Christ has done something very similar and is going to do something very similar for us. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have been purchased with a price. Not silver and gold, but by the precious blood of Jesus. And you've been set apart to him. You should not have an affair with the world. You should not be involved in sin and the lusts of the flesh because you're set apart to Jesus Christ and you're preparing yourself because he's away preparing a place for you and you're preparing yourself to be ready for his return. And someday he will return. And I believe it's not long from now. And when he comes back, he's going to take us to himself, back to his father's house, where for seven years we experienced the wonderful marriage supper of the Lamb. And then Jesus is coming back to the earth with his church to announce, this is my bride. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that lovely? And that is what Jesus has done and is going to do for us, his body, his bride. And so in talking about the tribulation, I think it's important to understand that the Bible calls it a time of God's wrath. The Apostle Paul is writing the Thessalonians again in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, and he says, for God did not appoint you to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now here's some really good news. There is coming wrath upon this planet. It's the wrath of God. Do you want to hear what it's like? We read about it in Revelation 6.16. It's so dreadful that people here on the earth during the tribulation say, they speak to the mountains, they speak to the rocks, and here's what they say. Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. The wrath of the Lamb? 
That almost sounds like an oxymoron. I mean, how many of you are terrified of lambs? How many of you have ever woken up with a earth, just this, this terrible tremor, and you wake up from the night and you say, oh, lambs might attack me. Nobody does that. Lambs are in petting zoos, but this lamb is different. Because this lamb is also the lion of the tribe of Judah. And there is coming today, he's going to pounce on this earth. And all the Christ-rejecting world are going to experience the wrath of God. And it is a terrible, terrible thing. But the good news for you and I is that we've not been appointed under wrath. Instead, Jesus Christ on the cross took the wrath of a God who's angry against sin to himself. He took your wrath. He took your judgment so you wouldn't have to experience the wrath of God. And understand this seven-year period of tribulation is called the wrath of God. And you'll never experience that. Now, that doesn't mean in this life you won't experience suffering. We do. Because we live in a fallen world and bad things happen to people. And suffering occurs. And things we don't want to happen, happen. There's also the wrath of man. There are people that are experiencing the wrath of man. Injustice and pain and heartache because of what people do. There's also persecution that churches suffer. And followers of Christ suffer in this world. We suffer persecution. You know, right now in Nigeria, there is horrific persecution of the church. And I pray for them nearly every day, and my heart breaks for them. Also in communist countries, Islamic countries, other nations that are nations that stand against Christ and his gospel and the church, Christians are being persecuted. But that is not the wrath of God. That is the wrath of man. There's also the fact that God because he's a loving father, will discipline his people. But that is not the wrath of God. In fact, nowhere in the Bible is any righteous person, any follower of God ever to receive the wrath of God. They always escape the wrath of God. Do you remember when God was going to judge the world with a flood? First of all, he raptures Enoch so he doesn't experience it. In addition, Noah and his family go up above it during the flood in an ark. Or maybe remember when God is going to bring his wrath on Sodom and Gomorrah, who escapes Lot. Lot and his family escape. The righteous are taken out. Or I think about when God brings wrath and judgment upon the Canaanites. He comes to Jericho, is going to destroy Jericho, but he spares the righteous person who's believed in the God of Israel, Rahab and her family. God always spares his people before wrath and judgment come. We saw this in the seven churches of Revelation. Do you remember the church that we all desire to be, the church of Philadelphia? Let me read about that church. Revelation 3.10 says, because you have kept my command to persevere. Let me tell you, God's command for you is to persevere. If you're under temptation today, persevere. If you're going through hardship today, persevere. If your faith is being attacked, persevere. We are called on to persevere. Let me tell you, if there's somebody listening to me today that you're just wanting to quit, you're just wanting to give up, maybe you're on the brink of suicide, don't do it. Persevere. It will be worth it. Persevere. That's Jesus' message to us. Persevere. And there is a reward for those who persevere. He says, I also will keep you. I will keep you from the hour of trial. Now, I believe this is speaking of the tribulation. Why is that? Because it says, which shall come upon the whole world. The whole world is going to be affected by the tribulation. To test those who dwell on the earth. The good news is in 1 Thessalonians 1.10, Paul tells us that Jesus Christ has spared us from the wrath to come. There is the wrath of tribulation coming, but Jesus Christ has spared us from that wrath. Jesus actually talked about the rapture of the church. You see it in Luke chapter 17. In Matthew 24, he's talking about what happens in 70 AD, and he's talking about the second advent. But here in Luke chapter 17, he's talking about the return of Jesus Christ to catch away his church. And we read it beginning in verse 24. He says, for as the lightning that flashes out of one part under the, uh, 
under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in this day. In other words, lightning comes quick and it's over. The church of Jesus Christ is going to be raptured right out of this planet. Verses 26 to 27 then says, And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. Well, what do we know about the days of Noah? Well, in Genesis 6, 11, we know the earth was corrupt before God, and it was filled with violence. But what did God do? He had Noah build an ark. God opened the door. Noah and his family and animals went into it. And then God shut the door. God protected Noah and his family when the flood came, and they went up above. They went up above the whole flood. Verses 27 and 28 goes on. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot. This is when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. They ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. In other words, it was business as usual. It was just normal life. You get married, you go to work, you earn a paycheck, you buy a house, you plant, you do all these normal things. But let me tell you, during the tribulation, you're not going to be doing those normal things. This can't be talking about a coming of Christ during the tribulation because during the tribulation, you're not going to be doing business as usual. You know why? We're going to see in the book of Revelation. In Revelation 6, right off, we see one-fourth of everyone on this planet is killed. And then in Revelation 8, a meteor hits the earth. I have read about what could happen if a meteor hits the earth. It's absolutely devastating. It's called Wormwood. And there is absolute destruction and mayhem on this planet. In Revelation 9, there's three judgments that kill another third of mankind. And then in Revelation 16, everything in the sea dies. It's horrific. In Matthew 24, it's so bad that Jesus says, if those days had not been shortened, if they weren't shorter than they are, well, then nobody would even be spared. Now, during that time, it's not business as usual. You're not thinking about getting married or buying a house. You're just thinking about how can I survive? That's all you're thinking about during the tribulation. So it's not business as usual. Look at verse 29. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. So as soon as Lot gets out, he makes sure Lot is rescued because Lot was a righteous man. Lot believed in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But understand, Lot wasn't a perfect man. In fact, Lot was a very flawed man, but he was still rescued. Verse 34 to 36, I tell you, In that night, there will be two people in one bed. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding together. One will be taken, the other left. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. That is extraordinary. We see that this is a selective taking away. A selective catching away. It's those who believe in Christ who are going to be caught away. They're the ones. And notice, it happens both during the day and it happens during the night. Yet it's one event that comes like lightning. It's so quick, but it happens everywhere, which is really extraordinary when you consider in that day they believed the earth was flat. They didn't know there was another side of the planet where on one side it's light and on the other side it's dark. But Jesus knew that. But Jesus explained that, that both on our side of the planet and on the other side of the planet, this event is going to be occurring. And it's going to happen suddenly. And suddenly people are going to miraculously disappear. And it's going to be like the days of Noah. It's going to be like the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. There's going to be violence, sexual perversion, injustice. And Luke 21 says that the entire world is going to be ensnared in a horrible tribulation. But again, there's good news. Luke 21, verse 36, for the believer, Jesus says concerning this tribulation, pray always that you may be counted worthy. Now, how are we counted worthy? By faith in Jesus Christ. We're worthy with his worthiness. That you may be counted worthy to, listen to this, escape all these things that will come to pass. I know one time, years ago, I was talking to somebody about the rapture. 
and he had a different view than I did. And he said to me, because he was post-tribulation, you are just an escapist. And I said, that's what I'm praying, to escape, just like Jesus said. I don't want to be part of the tribulation. If I can escape, I'm there. I'm there. I'm an escapist. (laughs) Jesus said we're to pray to be escapists. Now, there is a major difference between the second advent, when Jesus comes to earth, and the catching away of the church or the rapture of the church. Let me explain to you some of the differences. At the rapture, Jesus comes for his church. At the second coming, he comes with his church. At the rapture, we're the only ones that see it. At the second coming, the whole world sees it. At the rapture, Jesus takes believers from earth to heaven. At the second coming, believers return from heaven to earth. During the tribulation on earth in heaven, there's going to be the marriage supper of the Lamb, along with the Bema Seat of Christ, where those of us who are followers of Jesus will be rewarded for our good works. Now, let me say something about this time of the tribulation and this time of the rapture. I believe one of the reasons there must be a pre-tribulation rapture, or at least a mid-tribulation rapture, is because in the millennial kingdom that takes place after this, there are people in physical bodies, bodies that are flesh and blood. But we know in the rapture we're changed, and this mortal puts on immortal. So how can it be that there are people with normal physical bodies during the millennium? It's because there will be people during the millennium who receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and who survive and make it through the tribulation. So they're saved during the tribulation. They make it through the tribulation. And in the millennium, they still have physical bodies. If it's a post-tribulation rapture, then everybody has resurrection bodies. So to me, it has to be a pre-tribulation rapture. Also, following the rapture allows for God to complete his dealings with Israel during the seven-year tribulation. So there is a period of time where God is going to specifically focus in once again and deal with the nation of Israel. As you look through the Old Testament, God's primary dealings are with the nation of Israel. But you come into the church age, you come into the age after the day of Pentecost, and it's all about Jew and Gentile becoming one in Christ Jesus. So it's no longer Jew and Gentile. It's no longer male and female. It's no longer bond and free. All the divisions are broken down and we're all one in Christ Jesus. But things change after the rapture of the church God once again focuses on the nation of Israel, and that is the main group that he is dealing with. I think that helps us explain Daniel's 70 weeks. If you were with us in our study of the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 9, it talks about this prophetic word about 70 weeks of years. But what's interesting is that does not account for all of history from that point. There is a point where Messiah is cut off in that prophecy, and then immediately there are seven years left. Well, how can that be? We know it's been more than seven years since Jesus Christ was crucified. Because what isn't accounted for, because it was a mystery, is the 2,000-some year period of the church age. And after the church age, God raptures his church, and there is seven years left of the tribulation, where God is mainly dealing with Israel, and is called the time of Jacob, which is Israel, Jacob's trouble. And so to me, that all makes perfect sense. And then as believers, we're to look, watch, and wait for the return of Christ because his appearing is imminent and will be in a time it isn't expected. Now, let me explain this. If there isn't a pre-tribulation rapture, if there's only a post-tribulation rapture, there's no way that Jesus' return is imminent. There's no way that nobody knows the time or the day in which he comes. Because if you're living during the tribulation, you know the time and the day of the second advent. You know how you know? Because there's signs. There's signs that tell us. For instance, three and a half years into the tribulation, the Antichrist commits the abomination of desecration. And we know at that point, we're going to have 42 months left. So let's say you're a tribulation saint. You have put your faith in Christ during the tribulation and you're sitting in your tribulation cave eating your tribulation food with your tribulation weapons and you are marking every day after the decimation that happens in the temple. You know as soon as 42 months are over, it's going to be the second advent. 
But if there's a pre-tribulation rapture, let me tell you, those of us who believe in Jesus any day, any hour, any time, when we least expect it, Jesus Christ is coming back for his church. So that's why I believe there is a pre-tribulation rapture. And we are to be eager. We are to be expectant of his return. You know, my mother was like this. I remember when I was a young man, uh, my mother had committed her life to Christ when I was a little boy. And after that, she had heard about the second coming of Christ and the rapture of the church. And she was all excited about it. Well, one day we were visiting my grandmother in Russell, Kansas, and we're there in her living room, and I'll never forget this event because all of a sudden we hear this loud blast, and it sounds like a trumpet. My mom went charging out the door, and she started looking to the eastern sky. She thought Jesus was coming back, but it was only a tornado warning. That's all it was, just a siren to let them know there was a tornado warning. So we all need to be like that. We all need to be expectant of Christ's return. There's another reason I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. And that is because the Antichrist, and everybody's heard of the Antichrist, right? He is this substitute for Christ. This person who people consider a Christ. And he is going to appear during this tribulation period. But he cannot appear until the church is gone. Why do I say that? Because of 1 Thessalonians, or rather, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 to 8. And let me read it to you. Actually, the first verses of 2 Thessalonians have a very interesting scripture where it says, before the man of sin, the man of perdition, the Antichrist can be revealed, their, their church, first of all, has to fall away. That word falling away could be translated depart. They have to depart. I believe it's talking about a rapture. Now, I, I don't doubt at all that many Christians, which we're seeing today, prominent Christians, are falling away from the faith. But I believe the best explanation and translation of that is the church first departs. Because we see it repeated here in verses 6 to 8. He says, and this is Paul writing, And now you know what is restraining. There's something restraining. That he may be revealed in his own time, speaking of the Antichrist. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Don't you know lawlessness is already at work? But there's greater lawlessness coming. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed. This is the Antichrist. Whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So the Antichrist will be destroyed one day. And I've heard people try to predict who the Antichrist was. And I have heard some of the most preposterous ideas about that. But let me tell you, nobody knows. Nobody knows because right now he can't be revealed until the church is taken out. How do I know it's the church that's taken out? Because it says that he is restraining. And the he who is restraining is actually a, a neutral word, uh, and in the construction of this in the Greek, without getting into it all, there's only one entity that it could be, and that is the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit, who is restraining now, is taken out, then the Antichrist is going to be revealed. And he doesn't have the power to be revealed until the Holy Spirit is taken out. But we know the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit's omnipresent. He's everywhere. So what is this talking about? Well, on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the church. And we were indwelled with the Holy Spirit. If you believed in Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes to live in you. And we were empowered by the Holy Spirit, by the baptism of the Spirit, the Spirit comes upon us and gives us the power that through believers, the Holy Spirit's work is restraining the darkness. I want you to think about this. I know our world is dark. I know in our nation there are many issues and problems and sins and ungodliness. But can you imagine what it would be like if there wasn't a Christian in America? That's what we're talking about. Suddenly, the restrainer is taken out of the way. You know what image I think of? I think of a professional football game. And in a professional football game, or a college football game for that matter, there are these behemoths. <sighs> These Goliath-type people, they're called offensive linemen. And they are protecting the quarterback. 
And they're restraining the defensive line from coming in or a linebacker from coming in. They're restraining. But someday, they're just going to be moved out of the way. And when that happens, a quarterback is going to be drilled into the ground. Let me explain. This world is going to be drilled into the ground. But right now, even though it's tough at times, even though it's difficult, there's a restrainer named the Holy Spirit. And he's keeping the worst from coming. And he's keeping the Antichrist at bay through the church of Jesus Christ. Because whatever we bind on earth is bound and has been bound in heaven. Whatever we loose on earth has been loosed in heaven. So we understand we're restrainers. We're holding it back by the power of the Holy Spirit. The restrainer, the Holy Spirit is working through us. But someday the church is going to be removed. And when it is... The Antichrist is going to be revealed. And I don't know if I should say this, but I'm, what's, that's never stopped me before. Um, I think it's poetic justice. Because we live in a day when there are people that absolutely hate Christ, hate the Word of God, and hate the church. They hate people of faith. They hate people who believe in the Bible. They hate us. I mean, they despise us. They wish we'd just disappear. And someday we will. And they're going to get their wish. And it's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be pretty. They think we're the problem. We're the restrainers by the power of the Spirit. But someday we'll be taken out of the way. So the next event to happen in God's prophetic timetable is for Jesus Christ to return. Now, does that mean that the second advent, every prophetic fulfillment has already occurred for the second advent? No. Do you realize there are hundreds of prophecies that have to be fulfilled before Jesus returns in his second advent? But there is not one prophecy that needs to be fulfilled before Jesus comes back for his church. Now, that is encouraging to me. Because it lets me know that there is a true tribulation rapture. It also lets me know we're not having to look for signs. You see, if there isn't a pre-tribulation rapture, we're not looking for Jesus. We're looking for the Antichrist. We're looking for signs. We're looking for the fulfillment of prophecies. But we're not looking for that because our eyes are on Jesus. Because there's nothing preventing his return. When Jesus returns, and he can return at any moment, we'll be caught away. But then these prophetic signs will be fulfilled. Let's look at uh, 1 John chapter 3, because there's something very special about the imminent return of Christ, that we believe Jesus could come at any time. Uh, here's what John says in 1 John 3, Beloved, now we're the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he's revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And then listen to what he says. And everyone who has this hope, what hope is that? The rapture of the church. Him, in him, purifies himself just as he is pure. So the hope of Jesus' return keeps us pure. Why is that? Well, John says in 1 John 2, 28, And now, little children, abide in him. We all should be abiding in Christ. We should be living our life in the power of Christ, talking with Christ, walking with Jesus Christ. He may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Listen, there are people that when Jesus Christ comes have not been preparing themselves, have not been making themselves ready. They're believers, they're Christians, they're a lot like a lot, and when Jesus Christ returns, they're going to be ashamed at his coming. I don't want to be ashamed. Do you? I want to be keeping myself pure. I want to be living a holy life. I want to be in his word. I want to be loving people and ministering to people and taking care of the poor and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ so that when he returns, I am not ashamed at his coming. I am not ashamed. There is more I could share, and maybe I will, but let's, let's close this out today. More than anything, I want you to be excited for the fact that Jesus Christ is coming again. He's coming again. L let, me, let me share a thought with you, and, and this will take us a little over time, but, but I, I, I really have been considering this. I long to see another great awakening in our nation. I long for that.
I long to see a harvest of souls come in. It's like God. God doesn't want anybody to perish. That's why he's so long-suffering on his return. And my hope, my, my desire is to see another great awakening, a mighty outpouring of the Spirit, another great awakening in America and around the world where a great harvest of souls come in. And I think it may be. Because so often in history, before God judges the field, he first brings in the harvest. So before the tribulation, I think there could be a great harvest of souls. But the Bible doesn't necessarily say that. Because at any time, at any moment, before we leave this building, Jesus Christ could return. That should excite us. That should thrill us. That should cause us every day to say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your return. We thank you that it's imminent. My prayer is that we are ready and we are not ashamed at your appearing. And Father, I ask that for every person under the sound of my voice today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now today, there may be some that you're not prepared. You're unprepared. Maybe you've never received Christ, but you can. And I want to pray with you today to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So let's have every head bowed and every eye closed. And today, if that's you, and you say, I need to get right with God today. Could you slip your hand up high where I can see it? Can you just slip your hand up high where I can see it? Father, I pray for every individual with hand lifted up. I pray that you would absolutely overwhelm them with your love and your grace and your goodness. And you would, by your goodness, draw them to repentance. And if that's you and you need to come to Christ today, I want you to pray this prayer with me. And I'd like everybody to join us. Say, dear Jesus, I know that I've sinned. But I believe that you died in my place. And God raised you from the dead. And Jesus, I confess, your Lord, be Lord of my life. Please wash away my sin and give me the power to follow you. Amen. Now, if you prayed that today, God has begun a tremendous work in your life. And you need to let somebody know. If you're here in this auditorium, you can grab a connection card in front of you, fill it out. At the end of the service, there's going to be prayer teams here. We'd be delighted to pray with you. Or you can drop it off at the receptacle on the way out. If you're watching online, you can write decision at radiantchurch.org. And we'll be sure to send you that material and be praying for you this week. But I want to thank all of you, all of you, for being vigilant and being committed to seeing people who are far from God come to Christ because every week we're seeing it. Let's all stand to our feet and let's give those people a great big hand today. Hey, before we go, we got to give God praise and glory because let, let me tell you, Jesus is coming. Hey, hey, He's coming soon. He's coming soon. Hey, that's, ex- that's the best news I've ever heard. He's coming soon. Let's give Him praise. Let's give Him glory today before we leave this house. So we wait, we wait for You. Come on, church, sing this out.
Todd, right? Now, as we continue in our worship, one of the ways we do that here at Radiant Church is through the receiving of tithes and offerings. So as you guys leave today, you can drop those off in the black receptacles outside of the worship center. Those connection cards you can put in there as well. And I'm going to go ahead and call our prayer teams forward. If you have any need in your life right now, whether you need direction, you need healing, you just accepted Jesus and you need to know the next steps, please come down today. These prayer warriors are here to pray just for you. So before I excuse you guys, we just want to pray one more time before you go. Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for what a powerful day we got to have as your body, Father that we got to hear your words, to stir those words in our hearts, in our minds, in our spirits. And Father, I pray a special blessing over everyone who is here in the campuses. We pray a blessing over those that are watching online and even our brothers and sisters who could not be here today. Father, we pray a blessing over them. Multiply these tithes and offerings, Father, to where we can continue to help grow your kingdom. And Father, stir inside of us again that fire, that fire to walk out of here. Just as we heard today, to be excited that Jesus is gonna be coming. Why can we never share that? We need to share that. And Father, help us go out to spread your word, to spread the fire. In the mighty and powerful name of Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. Radiant Church, we love you. God bless you. We will see you next week. You are dismissed.